Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you, Amanda, for speaking so frankly about your own personal family experiences with mental health. Ladies and gentlemen, I am sorry that I'm not the most interesting Jeremy in British politics right now, uh, but if you want to meet any of his friends, they're just outside. <laughs> but although I may not be that Jeremy, I do have the most interesting job, and there is no greater privilege in government than being responsible for our NHS. And to do that, I am supported by a fantastic ministerial team. So let me start by thanking Alistair Burt for his avuncular kindness, uh, Ben Gummer for his youthful energy, Jane Ellison for her zen, where's Jane? There she is, Jane for her zen-like calmness, George Freeman for his passion and David Pryor for his worldly wisdom and Steve Bryan, my fantastic parliamentary private secretary, for his cheerful diligence. I have a fantastic team and I am lucky to have them. I'm going to... <laughs> my day as health secretary usually starts the same way. When I arrive in the office, there's a pink folder waiting for me on my desk. It contains a letter from a member of the public about something that's gone wrong in the NHS. Now, of course, these letters are not typical of much brilliant care that happens every day in our hospitals and surgeries. But I know that if I ignore the things that go wrong, others will too. I'll never forget one letter. A lady wrote to me about her brother who worked as a call center manager. He went to hospital for an operation for a pinched nerve. Things didn't go well, including a feeding tube inserted incorrectly, a catheter left blocked for two days, and cries for help left unanswered in what ended up being a pretty horrible last two weeks of his life. As health secretary, you have a very simple choice. Do you ignore these problems and try to sweep them under the carpet? Or do we confront them and sort them out? And it's a political choice too, because it's never comfortable for a government to admit when things go wrong. But if you care for something, as David Cameron always has for our NHS, you want it to be the best. That's what we want. We want the NHS to be the best. I'm going to surprise you now because I'm going to tell you about someone else who wanted it to be the best, who isn't normally talked about at conservative conferences. Nye Bevan, the Labour Welsh firebrand who set up the NHS in 1948, four years after a Conservative health minister suggested it, incidentally. Now, Bevan would probably, bless him, be turning in his grave if he knew he was being quoted at a Conservative conference. But he used a good phrase to explain what he was trying to do. He said he wanted to universalize the best. If the NHS is about equity, it has to be about excellence. If someone wealthy lives near a hospital with problems, they have alternatives. But everyone else depends on that hospital. And if we don't do everything in our power to improve the quality of that hospital, we betray those people. And we betray the founding vision of the NHS, which says that however fraught your life, however frail your voice, our society has not forgotten you because we have an NHS. <laughs> that was the vision of Nye Bevan before and it's the vision of a One Nation Conservative Party today. But it's a vision, I'm afraid, that in office, the modern Labour Party forgot. Their pride in having set up the NHS blinded them to the dangers of ignoring poor care. Targets mattered more than people. Good news mattered more than good care. So when we faced up to the problems of mid-stats, which happened on their watch, they said we were running down the NHS and even said we were trying to privatize it. They tried to vote down the law that set up an independent chief inspector of hospitals 
The true party of the NHS insists on high standards for patients in every corner of the NHS, however tough and challenging that might be. And although there is much to do, the results so far speak for themselves. 24 major hospitals have been put into special measures in the two years since the Francis report into mid-staffs. Now, people said that no one would want to work at these hospitals, that they would sink in a spiral of decline, that things would go from bad to worse. Instead, those trusts changed their boards, recruited hundreds of doctors and nurses, and transformed the care they give. Nine of them have already come out of special measures, and according to one study, up to 450 lives are being saved every year as a result. So conference, let's recognize the brilliant work of the doctors and nurses in those nine hospitals at Basildon, Tameside, Kings Lynn, East Lanx, George Eliot, Buckinghamshire, Goole, Lincoln, and Heatherwood and Wexham Park. They have worked so hard to turn their trusts around, and they deserve our praise. Now, across the NHS, the effort to learn those lessons and improve care has never been higher. And I want to pay tribute to some of the achievements that we've seen in the last five years. Record numbers of doctors and nurses. MRSA and C. diff rates halved. Mixed sex wards eliminated. Cancer survival rates at a record high. Maximum waiting times introduced for mental health. A million more operations every year. That's every single year, a million more operations than when we came to power. And public satisfaction going up now at near record levels. Last year, the Independent Commonwealth Fund said that under the coalition, our NHS has become the best healthcare system in the world. Better than France, better than Germany, better than the US, and here's something for rugby fans, better than Australia. <laughs> so let's hear it for all 1.3 million NHS staff working so hard in such challenging circumstances. <laughs> Those staff do so much for us, and we're proud of every single one of them. And not just the NHS. Let's recognize those working for local authorities to support our vital social care sector and public health programs. As you struggle with the pressures of a rapidly aging population, you too have had many successes. Integrated care finally becoming a reality thanks to the Better Care Fund. Smoking rates at an all-time low. Teenage drinking down. Teenage drug use halved in a decade. Teenage pregnancies at a 40-year low. Yes, as Boris rightly said this morning, the gaps between richer and poorer areas are still too high, but we are making progress. And conservative governments and conservative councillors will never allow young people to have their future taken away by accidents of birth or debt or dependency or addictions which destroy their dreams and take years off their lives. We won't let that happen. <laughs> now, I have a simple plan. I want our party, the Conservative Party, to be the party of the NHS. Some people listen to our opponents and think differently. So we have to prove it, and we are. For two elections in a row, David Cameron and George Osborne promised more money for the NHS than any other big party. The extra 10 billion that we've committed to the NHS this parliament is a massive commitment in the face of the worst deficit in our peacetime history. But what conservatives know 
is that a strong NHS needs a strong economy. We also know that high quality public services aren't just about what taxpayers put in, they're about what the public gets out. That whether it's schools or police or hospitals, the truly progressive party is the one that fights for higher standards and tackles problems head on. So let's talk about one of those problems. The issue of people who die when they shouldn't because they're admitted to hospital at the weekend. When we said we were committed to seven-day services in the NHS in our manifesto, it wasn't just about the convenience of getting to see a GP at the weekend, important though that is. It was to end the scandal of 11,000 excess deaths every year because of what's known as the weekend effect in hospitals. Now we're not asking junior doctors to work longer hours. That wouldn't be safe. And nor are we seeking to cut their pay and it's utterly irresponsible for some people to try and scare people into believing that we are. But what we do want to do is to support the many doctors who do work weekends with properly staffed shifts, safe working hours, seven-day diagnostic services, so that patients aren't put at risk. So I say to those people, working very hard right now on the front line. Stand beside us as we address this. What's good for patients is good for doctors, so be our partners in building the safest, highest quality healthcare system in the world. That's what we want, and that's what you want as well. Now, safe care isn't just about weekend services. And I'm going to say something that will shock you now. I wonder how many people know that every week we have about 200 avoidable deaths in our hospitals. Now, we are no better or worse than other countries in this respect, but still, that is the equivalent to a plane crashing every single week because of mistakes that shouldn't be made. Now, part of the reason for that is that across the world, often the culture in hospitals is wrong. Put simply, we make it too difficult for doctors and nurses to speak out about poor care. Too many worry that if they own up to making a mistake or blow the whistle on something that's not right, they'll be fired, as I'm afraid sometimes they have been. And as a result, not only do we cause patients and families untold anguish as they search for the truth, we lose the chance to learn from our mistakes. In our hospitals, we need an honesty culture, not a blame culture. And that's why I asked Sir Robert Francis to do the first ever independent review into whistleblowing. Some people say we don't have enough money in the NHS to deliver the high standards of care we all want. But you know, it isn't a choice between standards or money. If someone catches MRSA in hospital, they stay in hospital for longer, costing the NHS more money. Safer care costs less, not more. So let's eliminate the waste from unsafe care, and like the rest of the public sector, make efficiencies and raise standards at the same time. It's what our best hospitals like Salford Royal down the road or Frimley in Surrey or Northumbria, they show us how it can be done. So let's learn from them and never ever waver in our commitment to high quality care in every corner of our NHS. I want to talk about GPs for a moment and I want to tell you about a wonderful GP in Essex. Every week, he asks his practice nurses to write down on a post-it note the names of any patients they're worried about. And then he personally calls those patients just to check how they are. We have many GPs like that. But we also have many more 
who want to be like that, but find they simply can't deliver the kind of personal care because of targets and tick boxes and rising appointment lists. That kind of personal, proactive care, it shouldn't be a relic of a bygone age. It's how we'll make the NHS sustainable by keeping people healthy and happy at home without needing expensive hospital treatment. So on Sunday, we set out plans for a new contract that will support GPs to deliver evening and weekend care by working with other local surgeries and clinical staff. We also announced a £750 million scheme to improve primary care premises and technology to allow surgeries to expand and modernize their services. And it's why we're backing the NHS England five-year forward view, which will connect the services offered by GPs with local hospitals and the social care system to offer integrated care closer to home. Right for GPs, right for the NHS and social care systems, and most importantly, right for patients. Let me finish this afternoon with a point about the culture in the NHS, perhaps the most important point of all. Because if we're going to change the culture to make it more focused on patients, governments too, health secretaries too, are going to have to change the way they seek to run the NHS. And the NHS is the fifth largest organization in the world. I wonder if anyone knows the four that are larger. I'm, it's not the Indian Railways. I'm going to surprise you now by saying the name of a company you weren't expecting to hear from the health secretary, McDonald's. They are one of the organizations that's bigger. Um, also Walmart, the Red Army, and the US Department of Defense. The NHS is big. And faced with such a big bureaucracy, health secretaries of all parties, quite understandably, have tried to make changes by introducing targets. Now, individually, those targets have often worked, bringing down waiting times, speeding up ANEs, improving cancer. But collectively, they've undermined the professionalism and sense of vocation that should be at the heart of medicine. I'm not going to scrap every target because patients should never have to wait too long for treatment. But I do believe that peer review, transparency, and openness about performance is a better way to drive up standards than endless new targets. So last year, I launched a new website. It's called My NHS, nice and easy to remember. And on it, this is a world first, we publish more information about NHS performance than any other healthcare system anywhere in the world. You can see how safe your local hospital is, how good the food is, how good your local GP surgery or care home is, the mortality rate of your surgeon, and over 693,000 other pieces of data. From next May, we'll go even further with assessments on my NHS about the overall quality of mental health and cancer care, area by area. And because, as we've just been talking about, we still have too many avoidable deaths, we'll also publish avoidable death rates, hospital by hospital. Now, some people have criticized this as naming and shaming, but there are no sanctions or punishments for those with low scores, just the opportunity to improve. Transparency for patients, not targets for politicians. A new culture in our NHS where patients always come first. Conference, our healthcare system has always faced challenges. And our strongest weapon in the face of those challenges has always been our willingness to innovate. In this country, we discovered penicillin. We pioneered anesthetics. We made the first hip replacements possible. We unraveled DNA. We gave Britain, the NHS, and the world its first universal healthcare system. And we're not stopping there. We will soon be a world leader in curing genetic diseases with our genomics program. We are a world leader in using transparency 
to drive up clinical standards, a world leader in improving hospital safety, all backed with the resources of a strong economy only a conservative government can deliver. Some say, with pressures mounting, money so tight, we need to rein back our ambitions. But I say the only way to meet the challenges we face is to raise our ambitions, to face the storms, and draw strength from the wonderful commitment of NHS staff and the British people who stand four square behind them. Because with a one nation conservative government, for our NHS, the best is yet to come. Thank you.